This is going to be a question and answer video, and it's really just about how does a person get saved. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, wherein ye stand. So Paul gives us the gospel. And I do believe you must receive the gospel. By that I mean it's more than just knowing the facts. A lot of people know a lot of facts. They know that Jesus Christ existed in history. They know that Jesus Christ died on a cross. But they haven't received him uh, to be their payment for sin. So it's more than just knowing the facts. You do receive it. And from my experience when giving the gospel to lost people, many times they will acknowledge and admit the facts that I'm telling them to be true. But at the same time, they decline to be saved. Have you ever had that happen? You're, you're telling somebody the gospel. They, you can tell that they believe what you're saying is true. But they say, I just don't think I'm ready to be saved or I think I'm going to wait or I'm going to wait till a certain time. For example, they admit they are a sinner. They admit Jesus Christ existed in history and that he would die on that, that he did die on the cross for their sins. However, there's been plenty of times where that same person would tell me that they aren't ready to be saved or I've even had them tell me that they would wait until right before they died. To get saved or I had one guy tell me that he's just going to wait until right before the rapture to get saved I mean they acknowledged they were a sinner they believed all the facts however they would not receive it so there is a difference there do you see what I mean it's the difference of believing certain facts compared to knowing the gospel and trusting it to pay for your sin debt so he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Now notice that you can't even mention the gospel without mentioning our sins and a person must realize they are a sinner and if you don't realize that you are a sinner then you don't even know why you need to be saved so it's very important to explain to somebody that they're a sinner and that's why they need salvation because they have offended God highly with their sin that's what separated them from God in the first place that's the reason why they need a Savior. You can't mention the gospel without telling somebody that they're a sinner. Just think about it for a moment. Imagine trying to tell a lost person that they need to be saved and not even tell them why they need to be saved. So they do have to acknowledge that they have sinned. Before you're saved, you need to know you're a sinner. Now, before you're saved, a lot of people are saying... You need to stop a certain sin to be saved or confess all of your sins to be saved. Uh, you can't do that. That's impossible. You can't expect a lost man to stop sinning. You can't expect a saved person to completely stop sinning. Uh, you can't expect a lost person to confess all their sins because you got more sins than you even know about. But you do have to acknowledge that you are guilty, a guilty sinner. If a person realizes they are a sinner and that they need a Savior, then they have done something very important. Because if you realize you're a sinner and you admit that you need a Savior, then you've realized you're going to have to turn from yielding and relying on your own goodness. And... Now you're willing to rely on the goodness of Jesus Christ to save you. See, Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. He never sinned one time. He was the perfect sacrifice for sin. And when a person gets saved, they're basically admitting that 
they're not good enough to save themselves and they're having to turn to somebody who is good enough to save them, the Lord Jesus Christ. So they're turning. They're repenting. They change their mind about their own self-righteousness. They realize it's no good and they're turning to God, repentance toward God. So Jesus Christ died for your sins. He shed his blood for your sins. And verse 4 says, And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scripture. So he was buried, proving he died, and he resurrected, proving that he is God. So the gospel is, Jesus Christ died, he shed his blood, he died for your sins, he was buried and resurrected. So if you come to Jesus Christ as a sinner, and believe on Him and what He did for you on the cross, His death, burial, and resurrection, if you will put your trust in that to get you to heaven, then you are saved. You're not just believing the facts. You're putting your trust on Him and the payment He made to save you and keep you out of hell. Now the question comes up, what about a sinner's prayer? And the sinner's prayer is something that I don't like to go against or just, just go all out for it. Because I believe it causes more confusion when you do that. When you do either one of those things. Because as a general rule, when a person gets saved, I, I don't even remember leading someone to Jesus Christ or being at church and seeing someone go to the altar and get saved and not at least seeing them pray a prayer in their mind or out loud. So as a general rule, pretty much everybody, when they get saved, prays some type of prayer. So for me to uh, make a, a big study against a sinner's prayer or for a sinner's prayer, it really just causes more confusion because there's people back and forth saying a sinner's prayer is wrong or that it's works. And then there's also those who say uh, you have to say certain words or a certain prayer to be saved. Some people are against the sinner's prayer. They are against asking God to be saved. But the Bible is clear we are saved by believing the gospel. And if a person is willing to put their trust on the gospel to save them, wouldn't asking God to save them just be proof they were believing from the heart? I mean, if I've been presented the gospel, the facts. I know Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. He was buried and resurrected. And I came to God right now and said, God, please save me. I'm willing to rely on you. I'm willing to rely on what Jesus Christ did on the cross to be my payment for sin. Is he just going to turn me away because I asked him to save me? I was believing in my heart that he would. Why else would I ask? You know, why would I ask God to save me if I wouldn't believe in, in my heart that he would save me? Uh, talking to God and asking God to save you is a very natural thing. Our heart and our mouth are connected. Our heart and mind, it's connected. If I have something on my heart, then I'm talking to God about it in my mind or with my mouth. I don't believe it's wrong to ask to, to be saved. In Luke eleven eleven. Jesus said, if a, man, if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him, uh, will he for a fish give him a serpent? If you ask Jesus Christ to save you, believing from the heart that he is going to save you, putting your trust in his finished work on the cross, if you're asking him for salvation, what's he going to do? Give you damnation? If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Is he going to give you damnation for asking for salvation? Jesus Christ went through all that on the cross. Do you really think that he's going to turn a lost sinner away and put him in hell because he asked him to save him? I don't believe certain magical words or a prayer is what does the saving. I don't believe a sinner's prayer saves a person. But how often have you led someone to the Lord and they didn't pray to themselves in their head or out loud? How often have you seen someone saved at church and they didn't show some type of 
outward evidence of praying. Now, I don't make a big deal about a sinner's prayer because it's kind of a given that when someone gets saved, they're going to say something to God in their mind or even out loud. When I believe the gospel, I got down on my knees and I personally asked God to save me. And I mean, when you're getting saved, I mean, you're a new, uh, about to be a new Christian, you don't know anything about the Bible. I don't know. I didn't know the doctrines of the Bible. I knew I knew Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, and He would save me. And I sincerely asked God to save me from the heart. I don't believe you're saved by asking. I don't. But I believed in my heart, or else why would I have asked? Why would I have come to God in prayer about my sin problem if I wasn't believing from the heart that He had the antidote to fix my sin problem? The sinner's prayer versus no sinner's prayer is almost just meaningless. Everyone approaches God in some way when they are expressing faith in God in the Bible. It's almost a given that they say something. In Luke 18, 13, and 14, it says, And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. It's natural for a man to say something with his mouth or in his mind when he's got something so heavy on his heart. When the dying thief said his last words, he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. God made us to be verbal creatures. He made us to communicate. The communication is so natural that when someone is believing on Christ from the heart, that it's almost inseparable from saying something to God in your mind or with your mouth. And many people are against asking Jesus, like they will, I mean, constantly criticize a preacher if they say the phrase, ask Jesus into your heart. Now, that isn't how you get saved. That's not in the Bible, I know. Like if someone just said, Jesus, come into my heart, they may not necessarily be saved. But think about it. Someone could believe in their heart to salvation as they did that very thing. I, I'm not 100% on this, but I even think that the night I got saved, I knew Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He was buried and resurrected, and I was putting my faith in that to be saved. And I even think that I said, Jesus, please come into my heart and save me. I mean, when you get saved, Jesus does come into your heart. So what would be wrong with that? What's wrong with asking Jesus into your heart? You constantly hear people talk, talking against anything like that. They say, well, that's not in the Bible. It may not say that in the Bible. But I mean, I don't think that God is, is being so just, just so particular with a lost person that knows absolutely nothing about the Bible. There is one way. There's only one way into heaven. But there's no certain magical words you have to say, and if you say the certain wrong words, then he's not going to save you and things like that. I mean, if a, a lost sinner is approaching Jesus Christ, willing to believe on him for salvation, approaching him the best way they know how, if they say, Jesus, please come into my heart and save me, and they're acknowledging their guilt of sin, and they're going to put their faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, he's not going to turn them away, even if their prayer is all screwed up. So, if someone is believing in their heart to salvation, and they pray to God, saying, Jesus, come into my heart and save me, that shows they aren't just believing facts, but it shows they're receiving it as well. While some teach you have to say a certain prayer with your mouth to be saved, I believe that's wrong. Some take it too far the other way and say you can't say certain things when you get saved. I believe that's wrong. Some, uh, some person could be so broken at salvation that he doesn't even know what he's saying with his mouth, but God can see his heart. He can see if he's trusting in him for salvation or if he's not trusting in him for salvation. I can't see that, and you can't see that. But with that being said, I don't believe it is a prayer that saves a person. 
In Romans 10, 13, and 14, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? I believe the person, before I even prayed a sinner's prayer, I believe that I had already believed in my heart to salvation before I even called on the Lord. Because it said, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? When you call on the Lord, I don't necessarily believe you open your mouth. You can call on him in your mind. If a man is believing something in his heart and wants to receive the gospel, it's almost a given that he's going to say something to God in his mind or even in his mouth. And prayer is definitely a form of calling on the Lord. That's how you talk to God. So at the same time, I don't see how a person could say that praying a sinner's prayer would be works. Uh, that, that makes no sense. I don't believe someone's relying on their own works if they said a sinner's prayer when they got saved. On the other hand, there have been plenty of times where a person was presented the gospel. They knew the facts. They knew they were a sinner. And maybe they were sitting in church. They got up. They left their pew. They walked down to the altar. And they never opened their mouth. But they believe the facts. And even though they never opened their mouth, they obviously received it. Or why would they have got up out of the pew, walked down to the altar, got down on their knees if they were not going to receive it? Now, if they, if they came to God that day wanting to be saved and believing from the heart, is God going to damn them because they never moved their lips? I don't believe so. I mean... Was that not outward evidence enough for you that they received it? I mean, they were presented the gospel. They got up out of the pew. They walked down to the altar. They got down on their knees. Now, most likely, they did say some type of prayer in their mind. But even if they never opened their, their mouth, they still, I mean, they received it. Why else would they do all that? There are also people that say a sinner's prayer is works, as I said. I, I think that's wrong to say a sinner's prayer is works. I mean, Romans ten thirteen. for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How would prayer not be a form of calling? Also, if someone is believing something on their heart, as a general rule, most people are going to say it. Matthew twelve thirty four says, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. It's a given almost that you're going to say something or think, think, think a prayer in your mind. Also consider what happened with the Ethiopian eunuch. Let's read it in Acts chapter 8, 35 through 38. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they, went, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So Philip preached to him the facts using Isaiah 53. He preached Jesus to him. And the guy believed the facts, and he obviously received it because he said, What doth hinder me to be baptized? Notice what Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. It's about a heart belief. It's not about just knowing the facts in your head. And the fact that he asked about being baptized and the fact that he said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that shows that he obviously received Jesus for salvation. Now, I can't see if you've truly received Jesus. God knows and you know. You can tell me you have and I just take your word for it. But only truly you and God know. Now next, what about the Philippian jailer? He asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? In Acts 16, 30 through 31, it says, And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. If that man wasn't going to receive salvation, why would he have even asked uh, you know, the Philippian jailer? The Philippian jailer asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? I mean, he was willing to receive it. And, and Paul tells him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And notice that perfect phrase we hear so many times, 
believe on him. If you're believing on Jesus Christ and you're trusting your eternal salvation to be all on him and not yourself, there is a difference between just knowing the facts and actually putting your trust in those facts. Our problem for us is that we can't say, just say 100% that someone has received him. The Lord sees the heart and not me. Now, I don't see that either one of these guys prayed a sinner's prayer. I mean, the Ethiopian eunuch confessed, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And I mean, that's, I mean, that shows he's receiving it. The, this story shows that they're not just believing the facts, they're receiving it. And there is slander on both sides of these arguments. Some people say a sinner's prayer is works, as we talked about. They say that soul winners are just teaching people that if they say a sinner's prayer, then they're saved, even if there's no heart belief. However, no serious soul winner is, is telling, uh, should be telling a person to pray an empty prayer and not believe from the heart. They obviously know that there must be a heart belief or the person is still lost. A sinner's prayer without believing on Jesus Christ from the heart is not salvation. Do you really think the Lord is going to reject someone who is believing from the heart just because they said a sinner's prayer? That would be crazy. In John six thirty seven, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. On the other hand, you have people who say you must say certain things with your mouth or you really didn't get saved, they'll say. I don't believe that's true either. The night I got saved, I was alone. And I don't believe my lips moved. But I believed Jesus Christ. I believed on Jesus Christ from the heart. I think I even read a sinner's prayer from a website in my mind. And, and I said, God, I know I'm a sinner, and I want you to be my Savior. My lips never moved, but I believed in my heart. The facts had been presented to me, and as a lost person, I came to him the best way I knew how. The Lord could see my heart and knew I was receiving the gift. I remember getting down on my knees and telling him I needed to be saved. Do you think the Lord was going to reject me that night because I didn't open my mouth? That would also be crazy. I think you can go to an extreme on both sides. I think you can go to an extreme and say you have to say a sinner's prayer, you're lost with the mouth or you're lost, or if you say a sinner's prayer, you're lost, or if you don't say the right words, you're lost. I think that you know a lost person, they know very little about anything. And Paul calls it simple. And God's made it simple for a lost person to get saved. I don't believe that God's going to be particular about the words someone says in a sinner's prayer and things like that. There's one way to heaven. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And if someone is going to believe on that and come to God the best way they know how believing on that, then they're going to be saved. So it is more than just believing the facts. You must receive the gospel. It's a gift, and you receive it. And some people say, come to the altar if you want to be saved, and there's nothing wrong with that. But that's led a lot of people to think you must come to the altar to get saved. But that's not so either. And that's another question I received. Do you have to go to the altar to be saved? If a man's sitting in church and has heard the gospel preached, and he's willing to believe on Jesus Christ and what he did for him on the cross as his payment for his sins... And the preacher says, if you want to be saved, come on down here to the altar. It is very possible that the man can, that if the man knows he's a sinner and he's, going, he's putting his trust in the gospel, he's, he can believe in his heart to salvation before he even gets to the altar. The fact that he's walking to the altar doesn't save him, but obviously shows he's receiving it or else why would he walk up to the altar? After the preacher just said, come on down here and get saved if you, if you believe the gospel. Even if he never opens his mouth, I believe he would be believing the facts, obviously, and receiving it, or else why would he do that? I think it was Ruckman one time gave the example of, uh, he said, talking about outward evidence when a person is believing the gospel. It may not be a prayer, but he said, 
uh, pretend that I said, if anybody wants to be saved, come on down here to the altar and stand on your head. You know, it wouldn't be the standing on their head that saved them. But, I mean, that's that shows that they are receiving it. And, I mean, I don't think we should look for outward evidence that a person is receiving it either. I mean, it's, it's, it's God that sees the heart. We just see the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. And what about Romans 10, 8 through 9? Romans 10, 8 through 9, but what saith that The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. As a general rule, when a person gets saved, they're going to say something with their mouth. They're going to confess with their mouth. So, do they, do, But does this mean... A person has to say something with their mouth to be saved. I personally don't believe so. But, I mean, it's not much to argue about because, as a general rule, everybody does when they get saved. I mean, think about it. When you got saved, I guarantee you, the person listening to this, you probably said something. For the same, it's, you know, I don't believe that, it's, that everybody is going to say something with their mouth when they get saved. I don't believe my lips moved. But for the same reason, Mark 16, 16 doesn't say a man has to be baptized to be saved. I don't believe Romans 10, 9 is saying that you have to confess with your mouth or you're damned, you see. Look at Mark 16, 16. It says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. See, this leads a lot of people to believe that water baptism saved because it says he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but as a general rule men that get saved eventually get baptized but not all of them get water baptized they're still saved even if they don't get baptized but as a general rule men that get saved also say something with their mouth but not all of them not all of them confess you know, there are exceptions. For example, in John 12, 42, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they, they, they should be put out of the synagogue. Many people are scared of man, even though they're saved and they won't confess him. Someone could get saved and not even tell anybody. Or someone could be sitting in a pew and not go to the altar and get saved right there in the, altar, uh, in the pew and not even say anything or tell anybody. But they did believe from the heart and they did receive him. There have been times when a well-meaning preacher gives the gospel and says to a crowd of 200 or so people, if you will believe that the gospel, raise your hand and you'll be saved. Now, I admit, that may cause a lot of false converts. However, if there is someone in that crowd who truly believes on Jesus Christ from the heart, then they got saved. And raising their hand didn't save them, but it was outward evidence that they did receive it. All the, all the, I believe all it is, as sinner's prayer is, is outward evidence of what's going on in your heart. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. For example, when Peter was about to drown, he said, Lord, save me. What if Peter never said, Lord, save me? What if he just stuck his hand up out of the water towards the Lord? Do you think the Lord would just have let him drown? I mean, the Lord sees that hand going up. He knows uh, body language. He knows, you know, Peter's saying, help here, save me. The same way when Jesus, Jesus saw me that night getting on my knees and I was willing to trust in him and believe the gospel. I mean, I may not have said something with my lips, but I mean, he could see that cry from a sinner on his knees. I believe God has set up salvation in such a way that it is simple as it can be. Paul calls it the simplicity in Christ. The sinner's prayer versus no sinner's prayer can put confusion in people. A person could pray a sinner's prayer and not be saved because they didn't believe from the heart. A person could pray a sinner's prayer and be saved because he did believe from the heart. A person could walk down the aisle to the altar and not be saved because 
They don't believe from the heart. A person could walk down the aisle, acknowledging his guilt of sin, putting his trust in Jesus Christ, and the Lord recognizes him as saved before he even gets to the altar. Because it isn't going to the altar that saves anybody, even though that may be outward evidence to the people that you got born again. Uh, some preachers would have you believe the only time you can be saved is when the Holy Spirit is dealing with you in a church service. And this causes people to wait for an overwhelming feeling of conviction. It is the truth that God does have to deal with you before you can be saved. But God has dealt with you. If you know you're a sinner in danger of hellfire. I mean, that's God dealing with you. It's not just some overwhelming feeling that you only get a few times in your life, specifically when you hear a really hot sermon on hell or something. That's what a lot of preachers lead you to believe. They lead you to believe that the opportunity for salvation only comes around ten times or so in your life. But the moment you realize you're a sinner, until the day you die, God has given you an opportunity to be saved. Now, you don't want to put it off, obviously, because you could die tomorrow. The Bible says, for what is your life? It's even a vapor. The Bible says, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. The Bible says, today is the day of salvation. You don't want to put off salvation. But the moment that you realize you're a sinner, until the day you die, you can be saved. Now, somebody could reject Jesus so much that they don't even retain God in their knowledge anymore and they don't even think about being saved or want to be saved. But if you want to be saved, if you desire to be saved, you know you're a sinner, then God is not going to turn you away. I don't believe the salvation opportunity is something that comes and goes throughout your life. The moment you realize you have sinned against God, you have been dealt with. And each second you stay alive after that, after that point, God is showing you mercy by letting you live long enough to have another opportunity to believe the gospel. Some people may believe like, you know, you were under some heavy conviction in a church service and you didn't get saved at that time, so therefore you have to wait until the next time you're under conviction again. That's not how it works. The moment that you realize you're a sinner, the moment you realize you need to be saved, the opportunity doesn't go away until you die. And then the opportunity goes away because you'd be in hell. So it's not an opportunity that comes and goes, as some people might have you to believe. The moment you realize you're a sinner, that's when the opportunity presents itself. And, I mean, you have to realize you're a sinner to be saved or you wouldn't know what you needed to be saved from. So the moment you realize your guilt of sin and need of a Savior, you are under conviction. The Holy Spirit has let you know that you are guilty. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time of accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You don't want to put off salvation because you are just waiting for some type of a feeling to present itself again, or because you're waiting to get in church. Preachers will say that you can't be saved unless you're under conviction. But if you know you are a sinner in need of a Savior, and you're ready to accept Jesus Christ, then you are under conviction. Don't think you have to wait until the next time you're in a church service and the preacher's preaching on hell really hot, and, and that you have to wait for that feeling when your heart feels like it will explode. I mean, sometimes the conviction will be more apparent at times than it is at other times. But still... If you want to be saved, don't wait. You don't have to wait for a certain feeling. You need to get saved right now. I mean, if, if you've got a feeling like you know you're a sinner and you want to be saved, what do you call that? How is that not God dealing with you? What is that, the devil dealing with you that you need to be saved? The devil doesn't want you to be saved. You can be saved right now in the seat that you're sitting in. All you have to do is come to Jesus Christ as the guilty sinner that you are and believe on him.